turn in your Bible uh, to begin with tonight. We'll look at uh, a couple of different passages, but to begin with, I think I'd have you turn to 1 Timothy chapter, or actually 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> There's a famous uh, quote that comes from a book that was written by Charles Dickens. You all know Charles Dickens, right? Uh, most famous, I guess, at Christmas time for the Christmas Carol, Scrooge. But he wrote a lot of other stuff. One of his even more famous writings is a book called A Tale of Two Cities. And uh, it is a comparison of London, England, and Paris, France, during the French Revolution. And it's a story of conflict and uh, uh, between families and uh, a story of love and oppression. And there's a famous phrase that comes from that book, A Tale of Two Cities. And that phrase is this. You've heard it before, probably. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 and verse 126, it is time, O Lord, for thee to work. He says, because the wicked, the people, have made void thy law. It is time, O Lord, for thee to work. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I think that that phrase could apply to our current day. And I think that that phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, could not only apply to our current day, but to what the Bible calls the last days. I'd like to begin by just giving you a biblical definition of the last days and then develop those thoughts, because I think it's a balanced thought. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Let's look at the last days for, through those two lenses, shall we? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight that we can join together. We come in the name of Jesus. We come desiring to lift him up and desiring that he would be the one that gets all the attention and the glory, because he's the only one here worthy. Lord, thank you for being in our midst. You said it. We believe it. We want to experience it. We pray that you would just give that anointing, both to the ear and to the lip, that you would accomplish what it is that you purpose to do, through this time that we have together in your word tonight. Thank you for our Bible. Thank you for speaking to us as you do. And Lord, we just ask now that uh, you'd get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said I wanted to define as we begin what the Bible means by the use of that term, the last days. It doesn't appear very many times. Uh, in the Bible and in our New Testament is where we're uh, going tonight. <clears throat> but in the book of Hebrews, it begins by the, the writer saying, God, who at sundry times or uh, in, in many parts of uh, time and history, sundry times and in divers or in different ways, divers manners, spake in the time past under the fathers, that is, the patriarchs of Israel, uh, the forefathers of the nation of Israel. He spoke under the fathers by the prophets. We have a whole book full of the prophets speaking the word of God to us. In verse 2, he says this, but hath in, here it is, these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, by whom also 
He made the worlds. He has spoken to us in these last days. The last days here means the entire period from the first coming of Jesus that we just celebrated to the second coming of Jesus, which we look forward to. It hasn't happened yet. And so the last days fits nicely within the two comings of Christ. The first coming, Bethlehem as a babe. The second coming, when he comes as king of kings and lord of all lords, right? As is pictured in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. So between the first and second coming of Jesus is a period of time that the Bible calls the last days. I had you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, because we see in the first six verses especially a description of a progression that becomes worse and worse in the last days. Remember, it was the best of times, but it was also the worst of times. So in 2 Timothy 3, and beginning in the first verse, we have have this reference, this know also. Paul wants us to know something here that God showed him. That in, here it is, the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous times. As time draws to a close, things will become more perilous. That means more dangerous. Actually, That word perilous in 2 Timothy 3.1 is used in Matthew 8.28 to describe that demon-possessed man that had a legion of demons in him that uh, would cut himself with stones and would scream and, uh, and could not even be bound by chains. He had this supernatural demonic strength that he could break chains that he was bound with. And he is described in Matthew 8, 28 as exceedingly fierce. Well, that those words, exceedingly fierce, are translated perilous in 2 Timothy 3, 1, which tells us that in these last days, and as we draw to the close of these last days, we're going to see demonic violence. Evil is going to deepen. There's going to be a greater intensity of demonic evil and violence. In fact, it's going to become more and more acceptable and even be promoted more openly because in the last days, as they draw to a close, all human society is in fermentation, is fermenting, and rebelling, and it's getting worse. It was the worst of times. This is a picture of where we are in 2024. I'm sorry to be such, uh, to to put such a negative uh, picture on a happy new year, right? But this is reality. It is the worst of times up to this point. And as you continue to read on uh, in the second verse and uh, down through, um, let's see, verse uh, six anyway, the the first six verses, there are 18 different characteristics of this exceedingly fierce time that we're living in, these dangerous days, this demonic, violent, uh, 18 different negative characteristics But listen to this. What's at the root of it? Verse 2. Men, people, generic term for human beings, men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's big. And not only that, it says that they will be Also, lovers of pleasure in verse 4, more than lovers of God. They'll be lovers of themselves 
lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They will love self. Notice he says in verse uh, 2, they, one of the characteristics, covetous. That means greedy. That means loving money. So they will love self. They will love money. They will love pleasure. Someone said that if we love self, we can't love God nor others. In this universe, there's God, there's people, and there are things. We're supposed to worship God, love people, and use things. But if we are lovers of self, if we worship self, we'll ignore God, we'll love things, and we'll use people. Self-lovers. What are their characteristics besides being lovers of money and lovers of pleasure? Notice verse 2, boasters, proud, unthankful, unholy. Self-lovers are people that are full of themselves. They're boastful. They're proud. They're arrogant. Notice he says in verse 3, they are incontinent. That means that uh, they are filled with contempt for others and for things. And uh, they are despisers of those that do good. And they are just filled, you might say, with bitterness in their heart. Lovers of self, they foment bitter language. And notice also, it says they're without natural affection. You love yourself. You don't love others without natural affection. Uh, it, I think, has to do probably with the fact that you just, you don't uh, care about other people. You don't even care about family. There, there's not the natural affection. There's no family love. You have fractured families. They are, he says here, fierce. That is, without self-control. Uh, they're savage in the way that they uh, think and live and conduct themselves. They notice rebellious Disobedient to parents, verse 2, he, he says. And they're thankless. They're unthankful, no gratitude. And really, when you take all of these 18 characteristics and boil them down, it really comes to this. When people are lovers of themselves and not lovers of God... When people are lovers of money and lovers of pleasure, lovers of themselves, nothing else is sacred, nothing sacred to them. We live in a day when nothing's sacred. There used to be boundaries. We grew up, uh, those of us that are older, we grew up knowing that there were boundaries that you didn't cross. There were things that you just didn't do. There were things that you would not, you would not, you might think them, but you'd never say them. Uh, you never, this would not be out in the open. You say, well, maybe it's better that's out. Well, I don't know about that, but they're both bad. I have to agree with that. But the fact is, we live in a day when nothing is sacred. Not anything is sacred. This is really what we're talking about when we talk about the worst of times. So I've, I've painted a pretty ugly and dark picture here. Dickens says it was the best of times, though. It was the worst of times. It was the best of times. So I want to show you how that the last days are not only exceedingly fierce and perilous and dangerous, but I want to show you, I want to balance that with spiritual hopefulness by taking you to Acts chapter 2 and having you see that in the face of increasing evil and peril, 
that can be met with great, great hope. And so turn to Acts chapter 2. I want to show you another use in our New Testament of the words last days. Here's a third time we see it. <clears throat> in Acts 2, you know the setting is the fulfillment of the Feast of uh, Pentecost. Peter is standing up and he begins to preach. And he speaks to them in verse 16 when they're confused about what they're hearing and what they're observing going on. In fact, it says in the 12th verse, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what's going on? What, what does this mean? They're speaking in these languages that they didn't learn and we're able to understand what they're saying. What's going on here? And so Peter gives his explanation because some mocked and said, oh, they're drunk. <clears throat> and Peter says, okay, if we're drunk, it's not with alcohol, it's with the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 16 of Acts 2, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Here is the explanation of the day of Pentecost. Peter says that Pentecost was nothing less than an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit that launched an age of Pentecost. In fact, it starts in Acts chapter 2, but it goes all the way through the whole book of Acts to the last, the 28th chapter. And so Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 28, you see over and over again, Pentecostal power manifested over a period of 50 years. You see that the book of Acts is really full of what I would call little Pentecosts, pouring out of the Spirit of God over and over again, so that Pentecost itself, I believe, was a prototype. It was a specimen day, a foretaste of God's plan for the entire age of grace, which is what this church age is also called. The whole last day period between the time of the Lord's ascension back to heaven to his coming again. To this earth. So simply this, we are living in the last days. And yes, it's the worst time, but it's also the best of time because it is the age of the Holy Spirit. It is that God on that fulfillment of the feast of Shavuot to Pentecost, he poured out his spirit. And you know what? He sent the Spirit, and he never sent him back. He's still here. The Holy Spirit was sent, and he still is at work. Now, let's look a little closer at verses 16 to 18 and really get the biblical interpretation of this passage. Are you with me? Okay. you got to put on your thinking cap a little bit here. I want you to understand this because this is the, this is the balance to the worst part of the last days. This is the best part of the last days. Notice this. If we can uh, keep our finger there in Acts chapter 2 and jump back uh, for a moment, if you just want me to read it, you're, uh, I'll do that. But I'm going back because Peter says in verse 16, that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So I'm going back to the prophet Joel 
and chapter 2 and verse 28, and here's what he says. It's a promise of future deliverance to the nation of Israel that they haven't experienced yet. And it shall come to pass afterward, Joel says, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. That's the wording of Joel's prophecy. You know, <clears throat> I don't speak about this much, but in theology, the doctrine of bibliology, the doctrine of the of the study of the Bible there is an important doctrine called the doctrine of inspiration. And the word inspiration comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is, is uh, given by God and, and is inspired. Literally, the word inspired there means God breathed it out. All scripture is God breathed. And I want you to understand that that is exactly what happens here, because what Peter does is Peter does not, when he preaches this message and he quotes Joel's prophecy of 2, 28 and 29, he does not exactly quote that. Neither does he say that, uh, that this is an exact fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. As I just read in Joel 2, it says, it shall come to pass afterward. That is, God is promising through the prophet a literal fulfillment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, yet future, pertaining to the nation of Israel. Hasn't happened yet. When that happens, all Israel will be saved. All that Israel remnant that is left will be saved. Hasn't happened yet. But it's a, it's a promise of a literal fulfillment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit pertaining to the nation of Israel. Peter says in verse 16, this is that. What does he mean? He's saying in principle, what happened on the day of Pentecost is what Joel prophesied in principle, that's what you're experiencing. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, deliberately changes the word afterward that Joel used, afterward in the last days, he takes what will be a future literal fulfillment for Israel in the last days when Christ returns, and he applies it as a series of repetitive foretastes during this whole period that we call the last days. Look at verse 17. And it shall come to pass. Now, Joel said afterward. But Peter says, and it shall come to pass, here it is, in the last days. That period of time between the first and second coming of Jesus. In the last days, it shall come to pass, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So Peter deliberately leaves out the word afterward and replaces in the last days under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And what he means is that uh, during the entire period that, that is called the last days in the Bible, literally God is saying, I will be pouring out my spirit during this period of the last days. Not once, but over and over again. I will be continually pouring out my spirit during the period of the last days. So, that being the interpretation, let's make some application to ourselves. Here's the best of times, the last days. You know what it is? God's already scheduled revival for our time. He has already scheduled revival. God's purpose, according to these verses, 16 to 18 of chapter 2, 
is that uh, all flesh in every generation during the last days, he wants them to experience the outpouring of his Holy Spirit, to experience God's manifest presence in every single generation. My generation, you young people, your generation, God wants every generation in the last days to experience the outpouring of the Spirit, the, the manifestation of God's presence. That's his purpose. You say, is that what it's saying? Well, look with me in, down in verse 33 of this same chapter. Therefore, Peter says, being by the right hand of God exalted, speaking of, of the Messiah, Jesus, he's seated on the throne, exalted. And having received of the Father, Jesus received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He, Jesus, hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. The Messiah seated on the throne has poured out the Spirit. That's what he's saying here. See the words shed forth in verse 33? It's the same original word that is uh, translated pour out in verse 17 and also in verse 18. Same word. What he's saying is the ascended, enthroned Jesus receives the promise of the Father at the right hand, and he pours out his spirit, and that's exactly what you people that are listening to me preach, Peter is saying, that's what you now see and are witnessing. That's what you're witnessing, you see and hear. You say, okay, but what does that have to do with us? That was 2,000 years ago, approximately. Well, I want you to drop down to verse 39. Remember verse 33? Jesus has received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 39. For the promise, meaning of the Holy Ghost being outpoured, the promise is unto you, meaning the, the group that Peter is right then preaching to, and to your children, that is, future generations of Jewish people. And then thirdly, to all that are afar off. That's code for Gentiles, for non-Jews. Look at this. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the promise is to everyone. The promise is to all flesh, Jew and Gentile, during this period of the last days. So, let's claim it. Let's claim it for 2024. You know, there's been a group of people here at Bethel that have been praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our congregation, as well as other congregations too. And for the Spirit of God to be outpoured in our city, in our country, in our world for many, many years. And I'm Again, reminded of the words of the psalmist, it is time for thee to work, Lord. It is time for thee to work, Lord. It's 2024. We're in the last days. You promised that you would pour out your spirit upon each generation. And although it may be the worst of time, it can be the best of time if we believe the promise of the word of God. Simply that. Many of you probably have heard of the great uh, uh, 19th century preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, right? He was the pastor of the Metropolitan Temple in London, England, for many, many years until the Lord took him home. But Spurgeon was also called the Prince of Preachers because he had like a, a silver tongue, you know what I mean? He was... Uh, an orator par excellence. Yeah, and so many times he gets quoted. Well, I don't quote him much, but I'm going to quote him tonight. Here's what Spurgeon said. 
when he heard about the 1857 prayer revival that started here on Fulton Street in New York City in uh, that year and then continued into 1858. In 1858, Spurgeon, based upon that, he called on Britons to ask God to do the same thing in England that he saw was happening in America. And then he pointed to Pentecost, and here's what Spurgeon said. I'm going to quote now. He said, whatever the Holy Spirit was in the first century, he is now. And whatever he did then, he's able to do still. And it ought not to be forgotten that Pentecost was the feast of first fruits. Just the first fruits. The descent of the Holy Spirit wasn't a piece of history, but a fact bearing upon us this hour. The gift of the Comforter wasn't temporary, and the display of his power wasn't to be seen just once and no more. This is what the great preacher Charles Spurgeon believed about this passage and this promise that we've just talked about. And by the way, as a result of that appeal, God sent revival to England as well in the years that followed. And Spurgeon was used by God greatly as a result of this faith, this belief, this understanding that he had and this claim that he made based upon it.